Uh, welcome to El Shaddai Ministries. It's so good to have everyone here from all over the world as well as here locally. I just went onto our website. I just wanted to take a quick look at the screen. See how well we have people live streaming. Right now there are people live streaming. It looks like in Malaysia, India, Australia, all over the United States. I don't know. Can we bring up that our uh, globe thing? I don't know if we can even bring our globe thing up if there's any. No, Nick's Okay. But anyway, uh, welcome to the people all over the world, all of the United States. Thank you for live streaming with us today. We're going to begin with worship. How many of you think it's good to worship Adonai? Amen? All right. Uh, go ahead. Out of Zion, Zion, oh, comes your salvation, yeah, oh, and a nation will be formed out of him, and the people will be born out of him, out of Zion, Zion. a seat we're going to show you a short video first located in the land of the bible a historical moment is transpiring a special home for christian groups to learn about the jewish roots of christianity established by rabbi shlomo riskin the other thing that that i'm very moved by is his openness for dialogue and for relationships with Christians because there's so many of us that do care. It's a great opportunity to discuss about important things, not, to, not just for us, but for all mankind. The Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation offers a team of scholar rabbis and educators committed to working with you and your group to develop learning sessions in Hebrew Bible study that will enhance one's journey to the land of Israel. I was overwhelmed by how carefully they listened to our questions and the joy that they had in them. I, I would think that uh, Jewish culture is very rigid and lo law and they just have a joy and a hope and a friendship now. My responsibility uh, as a Christian is to know my Jewish brothers. Our biblical sessions are based upon a unique interactive approach that includes how both Jews and Christians interpret the Hebrew Bible. Participants are part of the process in breaking down the biblical texts, and the group's spiritual leader is provided a meaningful theological role in the learning session. I love that your way of looking at the Bible is what's the lesson? not is this right or is this wrong, it's what can we learn from this. This is the first chance you have to really just let go of all stereotypes and all divisions. This is a chance to bring who you are and just be who you are, knowing that the person across the table is going to be the same and you can just really dialogue, unlike any place I've ever seen. I think the, the, there needs to be this much more institutional response and the center is one such important institution. 
Our headquarters, located in the land of the Book of Ruth, Efrat, has a boutique hotel to accommodate groups for more than just a day of learning. If your group is on a tight schedule, our Jerusalem location is conveniently located near all the major hotels. And being here is like meeting my family, my, my long lost family, and they're explaining this is the, this person and this is this person. And it just has all that meaning like, ah, now I see where I fit. By providing a deeper understanding of God's word, the land, and its people, our programs will be a highlight of your group's tour to Israel. Do you understand that we're all covenant children? And I don't think that's there yet. And this place teaches that. So incredibly awesome. It's been a great experience. It's been one of the uh, top experiences out of all of the sites we've seen. Earth shattering for me, and I, and I, and I hope I can come and, and stay as, as a pastor uh, and learn so much more. here who believes in replacement theology who here is against replacement theology uh, who here loves the God of Israel how about the the land of Israel how about the Torah of Israel all right how many of you believe Yeshua was Jewish all right, we, we've got a place to begin to build a bridge here. I want to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, David DeCrutman. He is the executive director of the organization that you were just watching on the film, but he was a columnist for the Jerusalem Post Christian Edition. He was a, had a, radio, he was a radio personality for Front Page Jerusalem. And he's currently serving as executive director for the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation in Afront Israel. Isn't that exciting to have someone who wants to build the bridges? <clears throat> in this capacity, Mr. Nekrutman is breaking new ground and leading the first ever Orthodox Jewish institution to dialogue with Christians on a religious and theological basis. Isn't that great? Before that, he, was, he served as the Director of Christian Affairs for the Consulate General of Israel in New York. He was instrumental in the successful launching of the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem, the Israel Experience, the Christian Jerusalem Day Banquet, and the Watchman on the Wall program with Reverend Robert Stearns of Eagle's Wings resulting in millions of Christians praying and supporting Israel and the Jewish people. How many of you think that's a good idea? Uh, prior to David's calling in the field of Jewish-Christian relations, his professional career ranged from working for the City Council of New York as a legislative analyst to e-marketing for a major high-tech company in Israel. He received his uh, Bachelor's of Arts in Forensic Psychology from John Jay College of Criminal Justice and a Master's in Social Work from the University of Pennsylvania. And he lives in Natanya with his wife and three sons. So we would like David Nekrutman to come up. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Can we give a shout to the Lord? Yeah. There we go. Please have a seat. Uh, thank you, everyone from El Shaddai Ministries, Mark and Art, for hosting me today. This is history in the making. For the first time, Jews and Christians can finally talk with one another and not at each other. And we want to be part of God's covenantal experience for us. Because if we can get this right, this relationship correct, then we can be an example for the world that religion can be for peace. 
And to me, it all begins with Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. And for me, that's an essential ingredient because yes, there are differences between Judaism and Christianity. I'm an Orthodox Jew. I do not believe in the same theologies that you believe in, but that's okay. But if we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we believe that we're both covenanted. We believe in a common scripture and we believe in ultimate redemption then we definitely need a conversation. So I am here today to serve in Rabbi Shlomo Riskin's vision of creating a new bond between Jews and Christians that is anchored in scripture. For those who are already supporting Israel, I don't have to convince you about Genesis 12, one, right? 12, three, you don't have to do it. Be a blessing to Israel. I don't have to tell you that. You already are doing that. I don't have to tell you about the importance of Israel, about its fulfillment of biblical prophecy. You already know that. The question comes up is what happens after that? There has to be a relationship between the people of Israel and those Christians who are committed to say that the covenant of Israel has never been severed, You have already declared that replacement theology is not within your purview. You're atoning for past church misdeeds against the Jewish people, and you're taking an active approach to stand with Israel. This is a very unique time because we have never experienced a Christian like this. (laughs) And the question is what we do. As Jews, what do we do with this? It's very easy to say for past history, I would not be involved in such an endeavor like this. It's kind of scary. It's better that you do your thing and I'll do my thing. Or we're fearful of why you're really doing this. What's the agenda behind all this? There's a suspicion. So I'm saying, well, because of the suspicion, I'm going to not deal with this relationship. But I look, I bring it back to the book of Jonah. I bring it back to the book of Jonah. Why? Because God asks of a Jewish prophet to go to the arch enemy of the Jewish people, a Gentile nation, to say, please repent. (laughs) That doesn't go over over well, (laughs) right? Imagine the chief rabbi of Israel going to the Iranian president today and saying, listen, I think you need to repent a little bit. But you're laughing, but it's exactly what Jonah was faced with back then. And Jonah decided to run away. Right? He thought for some reason God is not in the sea. He didn't read that psalm of that day. But God is trying to teach Jonah something. Because if you look at Jonah's name, it describes his character. Okay, the whole book of Jonah could be encapsulated in his name. It's three letters, a yud, a nun, and a hey. And the yud represents the yam, the sea. Nun is neveh, is the place he's supposed to prophesy to. Hey is Hashem, is God. I did it in three letters, the entire book. But Jonah is also a bird, is a dove. And the dove witnessed God's ultimate wrath in the book of Genesis during the flood. And in essence, Jonah has an essential problem with God. How can you tell me to go to the arch enemy of my people to repent? I know that if you do something wrong, you have to go to your room. You got to get punished. That's what you did in the flood. And God is teaching a lesson to Jonah. Yes, there are moments that... I have that, I have to show my anger, but I am a God of compassion, first and foremost. What I want people to do is acknowledge who I am. And Jonah, you have that capability in you to ensure that the arch enemy of Israel can turn their hearts to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and repent. So, and he does it, and they repent. 
I don't want to be Jonah's first reaction. I am faced with a new type of Christian, one who affirms the covenant of Israel, one who's standing with me. I can go ahead. It's easy to go ahead and say, I don't want to deal with this. It's easy to run to the sea. But that means I'm not living up to my covenantal responsibility. And therefore, I have to put all this stereotype, this prejudice, this suspicion to the side and allow God to be God and allow the relationship to flourish because it's a sacred relationship, because it's based upon the Bible. There is different ways, religion has different ways of expressing God's covenant on the earth, but it's based upon covenant. And you believe in that covenant. And therefore, if your belief is graft, that you are grafted into me, into that covenant, then I have to walk with you in this journey together. And this is where the center comes into play. That yes, you are supporting Israel and is an important thing, but it's very possible in your support of Israel not to engage with the people. It is very possible, and it's really the reality on the ground, that you can come to Israel and go to all the, sh the sites that deepen your faith, but you won't say hello to me. And I think that's sad. And therefore, the center is an oasis where you can come and learn the Bible with Orthodox Jewish people and take time out and saying, how deep can we go in our relationship together through the Word of God? It's just not another site that you go to. It's relational. Because God is about relationship. I always love the example that Moses goes to God and says, I want to see you. And God says, you can't see my face and live. But I'll make a compromise. You can see the back of my head. In Hebrew, it's achare. And achare is made up of two words, ach and acher. You really want to know me? You have to know your ach, your brother, and acher, the other. Because at the end, if I see God in you, I see God. And therefore, we have to see the God image in both of us. And yes, we respect the, the theological differences. That's okay. I want you to be good Christians. You believe Jesus is divine and Savior? I understand that. That's fine. I don't have that same theology. But doesn't mean that we can't really glorify God together. When it says in Isaiah, we need to be witnesses to God, we need to do that together, not at each other. So this is where the center is, and this is why I'm here today. In my sacred calling in the last five years in serving Rabbi Shlomo Riskin's vision to create a new relationship between Jews and Christians, I'm here to say to you, I want to be your watchman on the wall. For so many years, Christians have been there to support Israel, and sometimes you never received a thank you. Well, the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation is that thank you. It really moves my heart when I, it's amazing, I call, it the, I call our generation the spiritual download generation, a little beyond Steve Jobs. For some reason, you and others around the world that I have witnessed personally have received a download to love Israel and love the Jewish people. There is no scientific proof for this. I can just tell you it's happening. I, can't know, I don't know what the statistics are because I don't believe you can even make a statistical data for what's going on because it becomes a personal download. I've met people from... Nairobi, Kenya, this year, a thousand Kenyans came out to support Israel. Never met a Jew in their life, never went to Israel. I went to a Christian Zionist conference in Germany. Talk about a shock for me of German Christian Zionists standing with Israel. 
knowing full well what their fathers have done before them, knowing some of them were, were there during that time, going to South Korea and having them go in front of the steps of City Hall and stand with Israel, the underground churches in China that are praying for Israel. I can't explain this movement besides that it is a, that God's hand is on it and it's fulfilling biblical prophecy. So for those Jews who may not feel comfortable with this, I would say simply that we have to allow our hearts to be open to it. And we have to figure out the way together in order to make this relationship work. Because if God's hand is on it, I want to be part of God. Yeah. How do you do this? How do you begin a relationship like this? So the way we do it at the center is we go through the Bible. And going through the Bible, we highlight how to do this practically. So I want to go through this journey with you this evening and for you out there who are watching who have a heart for Israel. You can pray about it, you can give to Israeli causes, but what I want is the relationship. This is where I'm coming from. This is my sacred calling in life. And I want to just give a personal thank you to Randy and Sherry Lush who are as part of your, your ministry for bringing me here today. I call them my divine interruption. <laughs> uh, we do have a common friend, Pastor Robert Stearns, and we met each other about seven years ago. I just came over for a dinner because Eagles Wings brought a group to Israel and they were part of that group. And I sat down with them and there's a certain anointing in their lives and in, in it with Israel, but they, our hearts connected. and. Uh, obviously, my Jewish mother is a little jealous that I have a Christian mother who I adopted in my life. And at once, at once it was in Orange County that I would go to California and they would host me and now I have, they went to Gig Harbor and here I am. So I just, uh, just want to say thank you for, for the friendship and the fellowship. Uh, it's changed my life. And I would have to say, because of you, I became a better Jew. <laughs> I'm gonna go through what I say, biblical nuggets for you to, this evening. Um, I want you to sort of get to understand a Hebraic mindset, and I know Pastor has done a wonderful job all these years, and I'm gonna highlight certain things you've been learning all your life in order to sort of understand the Jewish mindset a little bit better, and how to understand your own mindset so when to engage. So I love to talk about Isaac for a moment at the binding. This is a classic example I give. Isaac at the binding, most mainstream Christian commentators would say Isaac is a child at the time of the binding. Now, Pastor Mark will say he's 37. That means he read a Jewish commentary. <laughs> but there's a reason why Christians say that he was a child. Uh, there is something of what Christians learn, whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new. It's a famous hermeneutic within Christian thought. You just know that this is supposed to be whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new. But it's an interpretation. That means when you go back to the Hebrew Bible, you're looking at it through New Testament eyes, and therefore the binding is the preface before Jesus. And therefore, whatever didn't happen to the son would happen to the adult, to the father. Correct? This is typical teaching that happens in Christian schools. However, for Jews who don't have the New Testament, this is a very foreign interpretation for us. When you say, let us make man, you say Jesus is in that verse, we would say, why are you trying to convert me? Because we didn't grow up understanding your community of interpretation and all we see is you're trying to proselytize. So therefore, it's not that your intent is that, you're just saying what you learned all these years. But our in inference from that is what we understand in our history. 
And we're taking that with us when we're encountering the first time in this relationship. So it comes essentially down to how we grew up learning the Bible. By, learn, by highlighting this, we can then understand how we see each other and how we can finally have that conversation. So I just want to let you know this is not a debate, but just trying to give you sort of the practical tools of what happens. When I first began Jewish Christian relations about 12 years ago, someone said to me, have you ever heard about Billy Graham's crusade? And I said, how many Jews died and when did he live? Uh, crusade. crusade. Okay. Now you're laughing, but when I heard it for the first time, I, I went like this. Like, why is he talking about the crusades for? I thought this was done with. All right. So for us, crusades has a historical memory that is very painful in our history. And the automatic assumption is I'm putting that to what you're saying. And you don't mean that. You mean crusade and having fellowship with your, you know, fellow brethren and with God and getting people riled up about God. And that's what you mean. But I don't know that because I don't have your experience with that. I don't, and definitely many Jews have not heard about Billy Graham. Okay, so therefore, I don't know. I don't have that experience. So this is what I'm talking about. Language becomes so important. If you don't understand each other, you're going to talk about something that you never intended to argue on something that you never intended. And why would you want to argue if we're trying to build up a relationship? Okay, so this is why I'm doing this with you as an exercise to help you. So Isaac is a, complete, is an, a way to understand, wow, Jews don't have that hermeneutic of whatever is hidden in the old is revealed and new. Therefore, we can't come with the same conclusion as a child. But what we do have is an episodic relational connection in the Bible. Meaning, we only have biblical snippets of a character in the Bible. We don't know what happened with Abraham when he was a child. We're introduced to him at the ripe young age of 75. What was his childhood like? Doesn't say. Moses, well, we know he was born. We don't know too much of his life after three months. Comes back, kills an Egyptian, runs away, disappears for almost 60 years, comes back at 80, and then leads the people of Israel out. What happened in between? Doesn't say. So for some reason, certain episodes in the Bible are given to us, and we are there to understand its message. And there's also a rhyme and a reason for why this episode follows this episode. This is what we call episodic relational connection to the Bible. So why is the death of Sarah taking place right after the binding of Isaac? Because we believe that when Sarah learned of what was going to happen to her child, she was overcome with grief and died. And therefore, she was 127 years old. If that's so, then Isaac must be 37. Same verses, different age conclusions. But then people will say, well, doesn't it say he was a young lad in the verse? And I would say, yes, it does say he was young. It does say the word na'ar, which is young. And that word appears several times in the Bible. It appears in the book of Genesis later on when Joseph shows off his technicolor coat. He was 17. It also uh, shows up when Moses is three months when he's hidden. So the word itself has an age fluctuation. It means young. Now, if I have the hermeneutic of whatever is hidden in the old is revealed in the new, and this is a setup for what happens in the New Testament with Jesus. Therefore, I take the age and I bring it down to he was a child. If I have the episodic relational connection, I'm bringing it up a little bit. See? This is the importance of trying to understand each other's mindset, which is the purpose of why, why we're here today, is to begin that relationship. Each one is valid for his community of faith. This is not about right or wrong. It's trying to understand how did you get to that point. Each one is basing it upon the Bible and based upon its history of, of community of interpretation of the Bible. 
Now, I know you're aware of Pshat, Remez, and Sod, and, and Drash. Very good. For those who are not familiar with this, these are the four different ways of Jews looking at the Bible. What I'm going to attempt right now is even talking about Pshat, which is the literal translation of the Bible. How literal can we get? So I'm going to take the episode of Aaron and the book of Leviticus. I'm going to entitle this The Sound of Silence. So if you want to just to take out this piece and send it to people, we're going to entitle this The Sound of Silence. We are going to Leviticus chapter 10. There is an amazing dedication that's happening. Finally, the tabernacle is built. In the book of Exodus, we were talking about it all the time. But finally, it's being inaugurated. And Aaron, who was born into slavery, is now the high priest of a free nation. There would be no greater pleasure for a father to see his sons walking in his footsteps it is probably the most happiest time for Aaron, knowing where he grew up and to the position where he is today. And we're all familiar with the story. All of a sudden, these two sons bring a strange fire, whatever that means, and they die. It's a horrible death, a horrible scene. And what is Aaron's response? Exactly. Silence. What you're doing right now. What does silence mean? That is a typical Jewish question. It's a question we ask. What does it mean? Define it for me. What type of silence are we talking about? So some of you may think of, well, it was grief. He was silently grieving. Some of you may think it's paralysis, is a shock. It's not grieving, it's just the shock of the event and he was silent. Some may say that he was so grief-stricken, he was unable to voice anything. He was sort of overwhelmed. So one you can look at is that he's grieving. The way he grieves itself is the silence. Some people take death certain ways. Some cry uncontrollably, and some just take the pain inside. But there's also a bigger level, is that the way I mourn is this way. It becomes sort of a lifestyle, this is the way I do it. And then you can say, simply, he was shocked. And I would add one more thing, that it was none of the above, it was actually praise. And everyone's looking at me, praise. But the thing is, all these great ways of looking at it from a Christian point of view, as you would believe in biblical literalism, if it's not in the Bible, it doesn't exist. So if you're giving me your revelational moment in this verse, you have to back it up with Scripture. Is that correct? Okay, if it's not, then it's not part of our community of interpretation. So, what happens if you have, you have four verses backing up each of these different interpretations? What do you do then? So, we're going to go into this right now. So, if we, we have to understand that the word silence in Hebrew that appears in the text in Leviticus is vayidom, and he was silent. It's dalet mem is Silence. We have to find where this word is located in the Bible to try to understand what the literal translation of the Bible is. I'm not giving you drash. I'm not giving you sod. I'm not giving you any of those other. I just want to know what does this silence mean. Any questions before I go? I just want to make sure we're working together. Okay. So we need to go to Ezekiel chapter 24 verse 17. And it says there, be silent in mourning the dead. You have the root word dome there. 
And it says specifically it's mourning, that the silence is mourning. Therefore, if you were the one that said that he was mourning in his silence, now you have your verse to back you up. So far so good? Okay. Now if we go to, we go to um, the book of Joshua, chapter 10, verse 13. It says there that the sun stood still. Was the sun mourning? No. It was in a paralysis moment. So therefore, I can interpret that the silent here in Leviticus means that he was just in a state of shock. Okay? Then we can go to Psalm 39 verse 3. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, had no comfort, and my pain was stirred up. It's also in the book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 10. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. The grieving, the lifestyle, is silence. Last but not least, maybe it was simply just a prayer. And we go to Psalm 65, verse 2. To you, Silence is praise. Or we go to chapter 62, verse 2. For God alone my soul waits silently. From him comes my salvation. It's an amazing thing. So all four interpretations have their roots in the Bible. I can biblically prove it to you. Now the question comes up, which one is valid? From a Jewish point of view, we would say, all is valid. I don't mean to play fiddle on the roof with you. He's right. He's also right. <laughs> but what I'm giving you right is straight shot. Therefore, any translation is a commentary. This is why I'm talking about translations are usually commentaries. I have to pick something. What am I going to pick for this? Silence just in and of itself does not work. I have to have a context to what this silence means. Now from my own assessment from all these interpretations, what speaks to me is the praise more than anything else. Why? I, I can't say why. It's just, it just speaks to my heart. For someone to go ahead and face this tragic moment and feel the, and, and sense a godness to it is something that I want to reach for. I'm not there. But for someone to get there, that's a model. That I may not understand God's ways. That I might, all I want is to see my children and follow my footsteps and for some reason God took them bef before me, right in front of me. And if someone can come in a sense of faith and, be, and praise God, for me, that speaks to me as an ideal I want to achieve for. The other interpretations are easy. Yes, grief is given, paralysis. It's an easy thing, and it's not wrong, but this is what it speaks to me, what you call Holy Spirit. Well, we have Holy Spirit in our faith, too. All right, why is your Holy Spirit different than mine? It's important to understand when you have, even though you use Holy Spirit in a certain term, in a certain theological sense, but it doesn't mean Jews don't believe in Ruach HaKodesh. Don't believe in when a community comes together and deals with the text, that it does so in the Spirit of God. So here we are. We have an amazing way of looking at this episode, four possible ways of looking at it, all shot related. So far so good? Yes. Excellent. So, I would like to deal with the concept of drosh for one moment. Drosh is very hard that in my experience in, in 12 years in dealing with Jewish Christian relations is one of the f pillars of interpretation is very hard for Christians to accept. Because if it's not in the Bible, it does not exist. It's a bunch of doctrines of men. Your rabbis made this up. 
That is fundamentally what I usually encounter. So what I'm going to do with you today is I'm not going to mention one rabbi. It's okay. <laughs> For the purposes of those who are new to this and the audience who are looking at this, just to get a, a sense of what do we mean with drash. Drash is usually interpreted as the legends of the Bible. For example, let's say with Abraham. There's a great story of Abraham when he was a young child and his journey of faith he comes to the realization that there is an ultimate creator. If you already heard this story, sorry, I violated the 11th commandment, thou shalt not bore you. <laughs> Abraham, in his revelation of the moment that there is a God, an ultimate God of the earth, and all this paganism surrounding him means nothing, he goes, he wants to go ahead and live this lifestyle, but at home it's kind of challenging because his father is the actual person who is selling these items to the world. So he comes up with a brilliant plan. He enters the shop and breaks all the idols and leaves the biggest one there with an ax in the idol's hand. Father comes in the next morning, shouts and screams, and Abraham comes in. He says, what's up, Dad? He says, look around. What's going on here? Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened. Last night, one idol said he was better than the other. Look what happened. He won. And the father says, what are you talking about? These idols don't do anything. So, dad, why do you sell them? This is a typical thing of drash. I'm going to give you, I would like to define drash as the question you should have asked. That's the way I would like to interpret drash. And I'm going to use the story of a sanif, a snot. Asanath is the wife of Joseph, the daughter of Potipharah, the chief of On. Okay? Well, I'm going to set this up for you. So if I did the famous Bible quiz that is now on TV, I think it's still on TV, right? And I say, who is Asanath? And you would say, well, the wife of Joseph. Ding, 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 you won. Excellent. Who else is she? Well, she's the daughter of Potipharah. How do you know that? So we go to Genesis chapter 41, verse 45. And let's give the context of what's happening here. Joseph is not liked by his brothers much. They actually want to try to kill him. He is eventually sold into slavery. Whether the brothers did that or not is subject to interpretation. He ends up in the house of Potiphar. He is accused of a rape, does not die. That's a big question mark. How is that possible? Ends up into the dungeon. And because he's so great in understanding people's dreams, he is called to Pharaoh to interpret. And he becomes the most powerful person on earth. And Pharaoh grants him a wife, and that is Asanath. The greatest question I have is, and this is the foundation of what I'm doing with the drash today, is how dare our biblical forefather, Joseph, to go ahead and have kids with a pagan? And that these kids would eventually be incorporated into the tribes of Israel. I cannot believe that Joseph would do such a thing. Now the juices are flowing in the, in the audience right now. They're all saying, how dare he go ahead and do such a thing? The Bible says it, therefore it's there. So I'm going to say, okay, 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 hold on. Hold on. Everything's fine. So you have a biblical verse that proves that Joseph did it. That's fine. And I want to build up your argument even more. Okay? So I'm going to play both sides of the coin. So I'm going to be your lawyer right now. And if you go for a few verses later on, it repeats the biological lineage of Asanath when she gives birth to Ephraim and Manasseh. It repeats that she is the daughter of Potiphar, the chief of On. So there are two verses that say who she is. And I'm still going to say, I can't believe that Joseph would do that. 
But you say, well, whoa, there's another place. There's another place that says in chapter 46, verse 20, when Jacob is about to bless his grandchildren, it repeats the biological lineage. Three verses, that's it. David, you have a problem with your faith. You need to, you know, check yourself into some rehab spiritually. But my fundamental question is, I cannot believe Joseph would have kids with this wife. He might have to have accept the wife because of Pharaoh. But to have kids, that's a whole different thing. How can he go and have kids with a pagan? How can he get, go out the Abrahamic faith? It's not like he was a, a rebel without a cause. He is a person who is godly. When he speaks, he speaks in godly terms. Yet, he's doing what I think right now is an ungodly thing. But I got my verses to back me up too. Okay, you got three verses on your side. I'm going to go three verses on my side. So we first need to go to chapter 24, book of Genesis, verse 4. And this is when Abraham is instructing Eliezer to find a wife for Isaac. And there's a specific commandment from Abraham. You cannot have anyone from this land of Canaan to marry my son. You must go to my family. You can't marry outside the family. This is Godfather biblical style. So Abraham sets up the thing that you can't marry outside of the family, period. You might say, well, that's only Abraham who says it carried over. So we need to go to chapter 27, verse 46, to chapter 28, verses 1 through 2. There, Rebecca is looking for a wife for Jacob. And there's a specific instruction from both of them. I don't want you marrying anyone from the land. You must go to my family. So it was not simply a one-time edict. It passed over through the forefathers. This helps me to build up my argument that Joseph would not go against the family. The question we should have asked, how can he do that? He knows what the family tradition is. It's biblical. And I would say to you, if someone would marry outside of the family, what would it be called? And indeed, someone married outside of the family. We go to chapter 26, verses 34 to 35. And in all English translations that I know of, it is not equal to the Hebrew itself. It says that the marriage that Esau did to Judith and Basmath was a thorn in the family sides. That is usually what the translation, or grief stricken. But the Hebrew doesn't say anything about ko'ev or kotz, nothing like that. It says marat haruach, a spiritual rebellion. You have three verses on your side. I have three verses on my side. I have three verses to tell me that Joseph wouldn't do such a thing. Okay, so far so good. What would be the easiest way to solve this entire equation? Excellent, she converted. Usnach converted to the Abrahamic faith. It solves the biological lineage and solves the problem that Joseph can have kids with this. That would be the easiest way to do it. But then if you do that, I would say, how can you prove it? Right? If I'm coming from a Christian mindset, where is it biblically? Did, is there a verse that says, Asana converted? So I'm going to give you an inference to it. And we have to go back to Genesis chapter 41, ver verse 50. Before we go into that, there is a common community of interpretation between Judaism and Christianity that states as follows. God's language is precise. 
there is nothing extra in the words. If a verse is redundant or focusing on a specific concept, it has to be teaching me something I did not know beforehand. Okay, just want to make sure, both, just letting you know, both Judaism and Christianity share in this community of interpretation. If you go back to this verse, it says that Asanath gave birth to two sons and they were born to him. If I wrote this verse, I would have just said, Joseph and Asanath had two kids. Why the emphasis born to him, born to his faith? Okay? It's not a clear thing that she converted. It is used as a inference because of the redundancy or the emphasis in the verse concentrating on the male in the relationship. And we're saying that that relationship is the Abrahamic faith of Joseph. So far so good? Okay. So what I did with you up until now, I didn't mention a Rambam, I didn't mention a Rashi, I didn't mention anyone. I set this up typically that you would normally get in any message in, in a Sunday school. Three verses on one side, three verses on another side. And we have a possible, we have actually two possible answers. A, Joseph did it anyway. That's a possible thing. Or, Asanath converted. And here comes the drosh. I'm going to tell you a little story. But I'm telling you, I cannot prove it to you biblically. I, I got uh, Mark. I gotta get you out of the room. <laughs> She's telling each other. <laughs> Mark is already excited because he already knows the drash. The drash is that Asanath is the daughter of Dinah, Dina. Now, what, let me tell you the story. It's a, it's much better than the days of our lives. <laughs> Dinah, we are introduced that one day she goes out, one day, and she gets raped. Right? Shechem, remember that story? What happens to Dinah afterwards? You don't hear about her. It's an amazing thing. There's a rape that takes place, and this woman is never heard of again. Commentators are always perplexed about this. What, what happened to Dinah? So I'm going to give you a little story. She became pregnant through that rape. She gave birth to the child and named her Asanath. The uncles were not very happy about this child. Back in those days, being raped was a humiliation of the family. So they decided that instead of killing her, they would sell her to slavery. She ends up in Potiphar's house. Remember I told you Joseph never died because of the alleged rape? You should have, he should have been killed. But he ends up in the dungeon. The reason why is because Asanath testifies on Joseph's behalf and saves Joseph's life. He ends up in prison. During this time, Potiphar gets a job promotion. He becomes the chief of own. When that happens, he gets a name change. He becomes Potifera, the chief of own. So when Joseph comes out of prison and gets this lovely woman, he's actually receiving his niece. He's actually marrying within the family. Now, the purpose of the story is not to have a good bedtime story at night. That the purpose of the story is to teach you several things. Number one, how God is magnificent. Because Joseph must have been the most loneliest man in the world, even though he's the most powerful person in the world. He is this Hebrew ruling over an Egyptian nation. He is that outsider, and no one likes him. Who is the only person 
who can, have, who can really comfort him during this time, who has similar experiences family-wise, situation-wise, is Asanath. God provides the ultimate soulmate for Joseph. That's one. Number two is no matter where you come from in life, no matter what your family situation is about, you can be part of God's divine plan. Asanath, even though she's a daughter of a rape, is the royal family. It's a little different than Great Britain. That you can be part of the divine plan. The question is, are we ready to be part of that divine plan or not? But what I see from this is the message we learned from this drash. And you would say, but I can't prove it to you biblically. All I can say to you that this is a recorded story in Judaism for over 2,000 years. And that this is part of who we are as Jews, that when we're looking at the Bible, we also look at, at drash eyes, meaning we're trying to answer the question you should have asked from the beginning. And we're doing that in a sense of communal spirit with God and his word. And this is not simply doctrines of men. These are people who understood the word and trying to come to understanding the tension between verses sometimes. So when we go back, we're not to the verses that talk about the lineage of Asanath. We're not saying that they're biological, but they're adoptive. We're talking about the adoption of Asanath. Why would it even be repeated three times? You already got it once. Why do you have to repeat it so many times? Because this type of lineage was different than any other type of lineage. This was an adoptive thing, and there's a story behind it, and that's the story. So I'm giving you this verse, for the, this, this concept, because to tell you that when Jews look at this, you don't have to accept it. I'm not saying you have to accept it, it but it's part of our DNA when we look at the Bible. So far, so good? Okay. Now I'm going to teach you a little sod. Love sod. We're going to go back to Genesis chapter 23. Genesis 23 opens up with the death of our beloved matriarch, Sarah. Abraham comes to eulogize her and to weep for her. Now, in the English translation, you, you really don't see that the word to weep. To, to weep, actually, I would say, is actually a commentary. He came to cry. Let's just deal with, he came to cry. That would be the literal translation. But in the Hebrew word, ulivkota, there is a font change of one letter. As you know, a Torah scroll does not have chapters and verses. It has text and paragraphs. Jews don't think in chapters and verses, just to let you know that. We think in parshiot. We think of the Torah portion of the week. So when you're saying chapter 12, we're going back, chapter 12, 12, 12, parsha. Oh, lech lecha. Okay, gotcha. Now I know where you're at. There's also, it's, this is a thing, like when people say, do you know chapter this, verse that? It took me a while to actually think that way. It's a, it's a, it's a change of, of how you look at the Bible from a chapter, verse point of view. But if you go to the Torah scroll itself, all you have are paragraphs of text. Okay? And lo and behold, there are font changes of certain letters in the Bible. Actually, 90 font changes in the Bible. Letter font changes. They could be small or they could be big. The first letter in the Bible that's written out, Bereshit, because my understanding is you learned Bereshit last week, right? Or two weeks ago, something like that, two weeks ago. It has a big letter bet. The first font change, it's huge. Here's the second letter font change. It is the cuff in Vilivkota. The cuff is small. 
This is the sod. The sod is that there is a font change. That's the secret I'm going to tell you. Now the question is, what does that mean? What is this cry that Abraham is doing? Is it an uncontrollable grief? Is it simply shedding some tears? Or I would say a silent cry. Now, obviously, the question is, why is Abraham even crying at all? You're all looking at me. Why not? His wife just died. Oh, she lived a ripe old age. That's, that's okay. What are you talking about now? You're right. It's his soulmate. In fact, she is the woman who stood by him thick and thin, even though she was put into compromising sexual situations. In fact, twice. There was the drama of Hagar. Here's Abraham trying to convince the people that there is a God and getting them away from paganism. That's not easy to deal in a household like that. And she stood, stood by him all this time. And my soulmate is gone. It's a different type of grief. And therefore, the font change in the cuff. That is one possible way of looking at it. Another possible way of looking at it is he wanted to grieve uncontrollably, but he held it back. Why would he do that? If you look at the episode beforehand, Abraham is about to kill his future. He goes through this ultimate test, and afterwards, God says, you're my man. Abraham must be flying high as a kite. He passed the ultimate test. He has shown himself as a dedicated person to God, only to find out right afterwards that God takes his soulmate. If it was me, I would have walked away. What type of cruel joke is it that I have followed your direction? I did not question you. Only for you to take away the person who gave me my life for me during this earth, my wife. We say in our daily prayers in the evening service, God, please do not put temptation in front of me nor behind me. In front of me, we all understand. We don't want to get into that test. But what happens if we went through the test? We don't want to be put into a situation where we regret doing God's will. And this is a perfect example of the possibility of regretting God's will. Abraham was put into that situation. And he could have said, he could have controlled, un, he, could have, he could have just let out tears. But if he would have done, done that, he would have shown the world that he regrets doing God's will from the previous test he had beforehand. And therefore, it is this deafening silence. Another way of looking at it. What I'm showing to you is that we have various ways of looking at the Bible, all valid. Each one speaks to whatever, and you take away whatever you wish from it. But we also have in Judaism the concept of sod. I'm giving you sort of the secret. There is a font change. What that font change means is subject to interpretation. So when a, when a translation says he wept for her, that translator made a conscious decision of which interpretation to go for. Because I could have said it was a deafening silence. It was a cry of silence. Same, same way, same thing. But someone chose weeping instead. Okay. And obviously with Remez, you're familiar with Remez. And I actually pointed out to a remez beforehand with, Yon with Jonah. 
right? We took an acronym of Jonah's name and we brought out what the whole story of Jonah is. Just to let you know, when, I, when, I, when Christian um, visitors come to the center and I ask them, can you please give me the short synopsis of the story of the book of Jonah? So one Christian said, um, go, no, okay. <laughs> That was the shortest version I got. I thought that was pretty, pretty brilliant. I'm going to go ahead and do something a little brave. I just need to know time-wise where I'm, I'm fine. Okay. I'm going into the Christian Testament for the conclusion of this, of this talk. And I'm doing this out of a sense of Jews would look at the Christian Testament as part of Jewish history, okay? We might not have the same theology to have you look at it as divinely inspired and all this, but Jesus was a Jew. He grew up within the Pharisaical movement. His teachings are in line with many of the Talmudic teachings of his day. And therefore, what I'm doing right now is saying, just like I broke apart the Hebrew Bible, and I ripped it apart. You saw how I did that. And I questioned, and I brought everything together, and I presented it in a very Christian way to you tonight. I would like to just go ahead and step into your world a little bit and saying, how would we look at certain texts from a Jewish point of view? And I'm taking this actually from Dr. Amy Jill Levine, a New Testament philosopher, an Orthodox Jew, who teaches in Nashville, Tennessee. And she's probably one of the premier uh, New Testament scholars out there today. But I want you to understand she's an Orthodox Jew who is a professor in New Testament. Okay, so what I'm taking from her is, 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 is from her. I just want to understand where I'm coming from. She actually did something with Oxford Publishing of looking at the Christian Testament from a Jewish perspective. And it actually was published this year. Okay, you'll find that there's been a growing, trying to, a growing um, scholarly work of understanding the Jewish of Jesus and has been led primarily within the Jewish world. I just want you to understand that in the theological world, we do discuss these issues. It does not mean we are affirming a certain theological perspective. What we're doing is if you can't take, you can't divide these two books. You can't say Hebrew canon is one thing and Christian canon is another thing, especially if you believe in Hebraic roots and you believe you're grafted into the covenant. It requires to understand the Hebraic understandings of what the messages are from Jesus. So to me, I love the Good Samaritan parable. And often what happens with the Good Samaritan parable, it is given in a 21st century context. Doing any type of good is, a, is the model of a good Samaritan. Whatever the fashion of helping out somebody of the day is a good Samaritan. But it's a very 21st century context. And I would like to bring it back to its first century context. So I just want to say thank you for trusting me in this. And again, I'm not doing this as a debate. I'm doing this as a trying, again, trying to understand each other's mindset in doing this, okay? So first of all, we have to take the notion that reading biblical text is a dynamic encounter. It's not simply I'm memorizing verses and I did my quota for the day, okay? It's not your daily dose of the Bible and you walk away with the verses. It's a dynamic encounter. If you're not struggling with the word, you're not really reading the word. The fact Israel means struggle. We are always trying, we're always struggling with this. There's always tension. But it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I would say to you, faith begins when rationality ends. Do that again. Faith begins when rationality ends. Otherwise, it's not faith. So the same thing with the word of God. Just accepting it for what it is without an encounter with it is not really dealing with God's word. Okay? So the question comes up is what does a parable serve? What does it try to do? Why are we speaking in parables? 
can't you just give me the punchline? This would be a typical Jewish question. All right, now, enough with the stories. Just tell me what you need to do. <laughs> but the parable is there to introduce a radical concept. That is the first introduction to parables that because of the edginess of the message, you want to make sure the audience accepts it. And sometimes saying it outright is just too much for people to handle. And therefore, the story helps to lessen the edginess. But we have to understand that a parable is an edgy concept. So simply saying that the Good Samaritan is just helping people is not an edgy concept. We're all supposed to help. It says, I'm supposed to help people. Okay. So the Bible is there to challenge us. And we come to an interesting 12 verses in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. It is more than just a man going from Jerusalem to Jericho who's attacked by robbers, who strip him and beat him, and is only cared by the Samaritan when everyone else just passes him by. We actually need to understand the parable in its first century context. And why was this parable introduced in the first place? What often gets ignored is the introduction to it. And the introduction is the whole thing and why this parable was there in the first place. Biblical snippets do no justice to scriptural context. So we begin with the Good Samaritan. How does it begin? With a lawyer. Teacher, he asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if we were the first century audience back then, we would know in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark that lawyers do not have a good name. <laughs> wow, how times have changed. <laughs> if there's any lawyers out there, I am sorry. This is not directly against you. This means the question the lawyer is, not posing, to, is, is, is posing to Jesus is not pure intention. doesn't have a pure motive. I want you to understand he's a lawyer who's asking a question to be a troublemaker. The lawyer also begins with teacher. Now, normally the title should have been, if you, were, you had any respect for Jesus during that day, you would never call him teacher. You would call him? Well, rabbi is one thing, but okay. But actually, Lord or son of David. These are typical titles that you read throughout the Gospels. Okay? Rabbi is not used. Just want to understand. So the question itself is very problematic. For the lawyer treats eternal life as some commodity in Wall Street. It's actually rhetorical in nature. The lawyer knows the answer, but he's testing Jesus. And the test has a specific meaning in the Bible. Temptation. In the Lord, as you know, is entitled in the Lord's Prayer. It says, do not lead me into temptation. Meaning, do not bring me to the test. And just a few chapters prior to this parable, the devil tries to tempt Jesus. The devil was not doing this as Jesus, Jesus' benefit. The, so we understand that it's temptation and putting into a certain situation. So the lawyer is testing Jesus, now is playing the role of the devil. Jesus is in typical Jewish fashion, answers with a question. What is written in the law? Remember back then, there's no Christian testament. There's only the Hebrew Bible, okay? So he replied, how do you read it? Jesus is now provoking the lawyer. So combining the two verses, the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, the lawyer answers, love God, love your neighbor. 
So proof of the pudding is that he knows the answer and the whole purpose of the question is to provoke and tempt Jesus. So I just want you to understand he's answering his own question. Okay, so this is proof that this was not an innocent question. But the two verse combo is nothing new in Judaism. In fact, Hillel was saying this prior to Jesus. And the rabbis at that time were using the two verse combo as the primary base for all other commandments. Actually, Jesus himself in the Gospels of Mark and Matthew echoes the two verse combo as the greatest commandments of all. I call this the two verse combo, okay? Love God, love your neighbor. But the, the, the verse in Leviticus has a context to it. Has a specific context of what it means to love your neighbor. We can define neighbor as right in this community here. You're her neighbor, she's your neighbor. You can do it in the community of believers, right? Within your own religion. In fact, some Jewish, Jewish commentaries look at love your neighbor as yourself as love your Jew, love a fellow Jew as yourself. But if you actually go to the context of it, what's the reason why I have to love my neighbor? It's because I was an immigrant in the land of Egypt. It wasn't that I was a Jew in the land of Egypt, it was I was an immigrant, I was someone else, right? So loving your neighbor goes beyond your religious community. So while the lawyer is asking how to inherit eternal life, thinking that one action can make it all happen, that it could be scheduled on a 10 o'clock morning brunch, what does Jesus' answer? Do this and live. What does that answer mean? The lawyer's thinking it's a commodity. He thinks it's something you can put on a calendar. Jesus' answer is do this and live. This means this is a lifestyle. This is not something you just do in the morning. It is a way of life. Now, at this particular point in time, the lawyer should have walked away. <laughs> but he's a wise guy. Who's my neighbor? It's exactly what it is. Who's my neighbor? What do you mean? We just were told. Right? Now he's provoking. What he's trying to do is trying to put, tell me, give me that definition. Define what neighbor means for me. He's provoking him again. The lawyer is actually ignoring his own faith principles. Because if you go to Proverbs chapter 28, it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Pretty simple. But what it shows is love is not an intellectual concept. Love is an action. When it says love God, what does it mean to love God? Either I love or I love, love my neighbor. Or either I love you or I don't love you. How can you command me to love? How's that emotion working? Well, I don't feel it right now. Our chemistry is not happening. All right? Because love is action. I am doing this action because I'm trying to go for that love. Now, Jesus could have gone ahead and gone on a whole discourse of the meaning of what neighbor is all about. Now comes the parable. Okay, you can't ignore the introduction and go straight to the parable. Because the reason why he's doing the parable is now it's going to be razor sharp. Razor sharp. He might be bleeding afterwards, just like the Samaritan was. Not the Samaritan, the guy who got beaten up. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a story that's going to indict the lawyer. We have an unidentified man who's beaten to a pulp by a band of robbers. 
He's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Both a priest and the Levite pass him. But it does not give any reason as to why they did not adhere to the Mosaic law of helping a person in need. Nor is it our job to become speculators of the issue. The fact is that they did not do it. Often what happens here is people become speculators and say the reason why they didn't go next to the guy is because of ritual impurity. Well, there's a problem with that. He wasn't going from Jericho to Jerusalem. Therefore, you would need to be pure because you're going into the temple. He's coming back. Okay. In addition, the ritual purity laws of a priest are not the same for a Levite. So it's not about purity or impurity here. They just did not go ahead and adhere to their biblical mandate of helping the person. What often happens here is we, this becomes a big thing in Jewish Christian relations and saying like look at the priests and look at the Levites, look at them, they don't listen to their law and, and puts a negative thing on, on, on the Jews of the day. But who stops to help the person? A Samaritan. Now we have to understand when he takes pity, that word pity, that appears in the Gospel of Luke is in the Greek, a very unique word. And it means it's in your gut. It's a pity that goes to, your, to, the, to the core of you that makes you want to act. It's not, ah, uh, that's really sad. Let's help you out. No, there's something that inside your guts that makes you want to act. That's the Greek word of it. Now, the Samaritan is not a marginalized member of society. We have to understand who the Samaritan was. He's actually the enemy of the people. Okay? Everyone thinks the Samaritan, you know, oh, yeah, it's just another Joe Schmo. No, he is an enemy of the people. In the chapter before the parable, if you go to Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 56, six Luke depicts the Samaritans as refusing Jesus' hospitality. The apostles John and, and James suggest a little vengeance. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from the heaven to consume them? Okay, so I just want to let you know the Samaritan was not liked even among Jesus' disciples, right? Let's bring a little thunder and lightning. We'll have a barbecue tonight. Okay. John 4, verses 9 states, Jews do not share in things in common with the Samaritans. The Jewish historian Josephus reports that during the governorship, Samaritans killed a great many Galilean pilgrims traveling to Jerusalem. So they're murderers. They're an enemy. They're not liked even in Jesus' camp. So we're dealing with a certain specific type of person when Jesus is talking about the Good Samaritan. So the idea of a Samaritan helping someone off, someone else, is so far off the radar screen, it makes the parable message even stronger. Another thing you should know about Samaria is the place where the northern kingdom lived after the breakup of Solomon's kingship. It also has an alias, Shechem. Shechem is not a good place for us in the Bible. We just talked about it before, right? The whole rape of Dinah. And in fact, in the book of Judges chapter 8 and 9, Shechem is mentioned again in the false judge of Abimelech who is a mass murderer. So just proving the point is the Samaritan is not your normal Joe Schmo. So the person most unlikely to bandage the wounds of this beaten up person is the Samaritan. And what he does is just not only takes him out and helps him, he bandages him, he puts him on his own donkey, he brings him to the hotel, it says, whatever the guy needs, put it, put it on my tab. Look after him. 
What's interesting after this parable is done, Jesus says, who is the, who, who is this, who is the person we're talking about? And the lawyer cannot bring himself to say, Samaritan. He says, the person who had mercy on him. The hate the lawyer has in his soul is such that he cannot even bring the name of his arch enemy. It's a huge concept. But what Jesus is doing when he conjures up this whole Good Samaritan parable is not a New Testament revelational moment. It's actually bringing the lawyer to remember the national conscience of the Jewish people. It goes back to Second Chronicles. This is the Hebraic roots of it all. Second Chronicles chapter 28. It recounts how the prophet Oded convinced the Samaritans to aid their Judean captives, their POWs. The Judeans are POWs. And I would expect the Samaritan to do all sorts of torture. Oded comes out and says, please treat them well. And they had compassion. Who is your neighbor? It's that Samaritan, that arch enemy that lingers throughout you, that you can never hate. You have no right to do that. That the person you hate the most is the person you have to love the most. That's the edginess. That's edgy. Not just to help any Joe Schmo out there. But it goes back to a national conscience of the Jewish people that they were once POWs and they got treated by the Samaritans okay. They were warring with one another. You're, I got you now. And Jesus is saying, look what Oded did. Remember Oded? What happened? And they had compassion. Where is your compassion? So this is the way we would look at the parable in, in this context. Okay. I was supposed to be a Jewish Al Pacino. <laughs> and I ended up in Jewish Christian relations. God is the ultimate comedian. So I had a Jewish boy who grew up in the yeshiva world with a black hat, little long silocks, and Brooklyn, New York, end up to be with you today. It began in the uh, Israeli consulate in New York in 2000. I was asked to help out the Consul General with New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut, and the, all the political seats that were opening up there, because I served in the City Council of New York under the Giuliani administration, both for the Democrats and the Republicans. And I was just basically supposed to be the person to help out for Campaign 2000, do media, build up Latino affairs for the Israeli government, and when the Intifada broke out, uh, one of my bosses, uh, Yossi Livnet, who was then the Deputy Consul General in New York, spoke Spanish, and I, brought him, I got him on Telemundo television. And there was a Brooklyn Spanish-speaking pastor who saw my boss and got a calling from God to do a night to celebrate Israel in Spanish. Invited my boss to be the main speaker. At the last moment, right before Shabbat, I get a call from my boss saying he can't go. Can you go instead of me? Now, before I give you my response, let me just give you a context <laughs> of what I'm feeling at this point in time. I grew up in a very secluded yeshiva world. Thinking Christianity, there's nothing good of it. The cross was something that 
killed my people, that walking into a church is a violation of idol worship. I just want you to understand, when I'm asked this question, this is what I'm asked, this is what I'm thinking. But he's my boss. So I said yes. And trying to find a legal loophole, I call up my pulpit rabbi, Rabbi Dr. Gerald Meister. I said, Rabbi, can I go? He says, yes, you're like in the Israeli army. They give you a command, no questions asked. So I said, Rabbi, thank you for the dispensation. I am going to church tonight. <laughs> Walking into a room similar to this, even though I thought of the iconic imagery of Hollywood with, from the Catholic Church, I didn't know what I was going to expect. I see people from different Spanish-speaking nations waving Israeli flags, singing Israeli songs, and loving Israel more than most of my Jewish brothers and sisters. And I'm in the twilight zone. <laughs> Who are you? Where did you come from? But I was just there to represent the Israeli consulate, nothing more. And for some reason, I was a success, and Monday morning comes along, the consul general brings me into his room, says, David, kala kavod, good for you. You're in charge of Christian affairs now. <laughs> Hey, second, hold on. <laughs> Want to understand this? this? is my first time in church. It wasn't even a church service. It was an Israel service. I don't know anything about Christianity. And you're picking me to do this. Wow, now I understand why our foreign policy is so screwed up. <laughs> so in Jewish terms, I needed to uh, think about it. And in Christian terms, I needed to pray about it. And I go back to my pulpit rabbi and I, I said, Rabbi, what do you think? He says, well, for 25 years, I'm, I was doing Jewish Christian relations. I didn't know about that. I didn't know this about my rabbi. And you have two paths you can take with this portfolio. One, you can really capture the media of it all. Or you can do this from covenant that Jews and Christians share within the covenant of God, and you walk with that in a faith sense. No agendas, simply a journey of faith. I prefer you do the latter than the former. And he begins this theological jargon road, which I do not understand one word of what he's saying. And I said, Rabbi, if you think I should do it, I will do it. I go back to the consul general and I repeat everything my rabbi said. I was a good parrot back then. And I will do this on three conditions. Number one, I need to learn about Christianity. Number two, we have to do this from faith. And number three, I need my rabbi aboard. And he agrees and he says, well, you have to write a white paper on every single denomination in Christianity, their political and theological stance on Israel. You have six months to complete it. You're all going well, but I all thought you were Catholic. <laughs> I, I, I didn't understand the Protestant movement after going into this whole thing. and found out that, wow, you have 3,000 different movements in Christianity. <laughs> 150 Baptist movements alone, besides the North and the Southern. So Lutherans, Episcopalians, and all your mainline so back then, um, we had to make a decision, limited resources, limited funding, who we'd have a relationship first. Uh, unfortunately, back then, the sex scandal abuse of the Catholic Church was prominent in the newspapers. There was budget cuts happening. The division in, with Jewish-Catholic relations was dwindled to a couple of people. And Israel was not on the radar screen at that particular point in time. But for us, in the Jewish world, in the Israeli world, there's a pope. There's a diocese. There are people appointed to these positions in Jewish-Catholic relations. So for us, it would be easy to deal with an organized entity. In the mainline world, which is still happening today, is the divestment campaign. If you're familiar with the divestment campaign, it is basically 
divesting any, with, from any company dealing with Israel, specifically pension funds, the church's pension funds. So that's a negative. In the evangelical world, I didn't know anything. I had a book, Billy Graham, Ambassador to God. I didn't know, you know, what I'm supposed to do. So I embrace yourself for a Seinfeld moment right now. I call up the, uh, the church that got me in, into this whole thing to begin with, and I said, please meet me in Grand Central Station. Let's have a hot dog, and we'll talk about how we're gonna conquer Jewish-Christian relations. So we're there with a hot dog, and I said, listen, I wanna put on the first Christian prayer service in an Israeli consulate for the peace of Israel. Can you help me out? Okay, I want you to understand we're having a Christian prayer service Charismatic, possible tongues. <laughs> and they said they'll agree to do it. And I had to get permission from the Israeli government to allow a prayer service to even happen in the consulate because we don't even do our own prayers. And in March of 2002, we had the first prayer service. And at that particular meeting, I encountered an amazing individual, a person who had an anointing in his life about Israel, that was Robert Stearns. And back then when I described Robert as a person who, had, who was sort of the upcoming John Hagee with the charisma of a Jack Hayford. And we began this partnership together and we created the, the Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem, the first Sunday of every October, which started with 100 leaders in May of 2002 and now has 300,000 churches worldwide praying for Israel on that day. The Israel Experience, we take <coughs> Christian university students and we bring them to Israel for three weeks, become educated ambassadors for Israel. The Watchman on the Wall, which should become a prayer intercessor for Israel, which got adopted by a GLOW International and a Jerusalem Banquet, celebrating the reunification of Jerusalem with Israel. I have been very fortunate in my life that I was able to serve that vision. I don't know why God particularly picked me, and I still don't understand it today. But after that experience, I wanted to move to Israel with my family. And never thinking that I would enter back into Jewish Christian relations. I'm an immigrant in my homeland. I become a salesman for a book publishing company. I end up in a high-tech job. Life is good. And then I get another divine interruption. <laughs> rabbi Riskin, chief rabbi of Efrat, the place where Boaz and Ruth consummate their union, where redemption comes from, who refounded this city almost 30 years ago, who left a comfortable Manhattan career behind as a rabbi in Lincoln Square Synagogue, which he opened during Studio 54 days. For those people who are very young, that's the disco era. <laughs> and says, I just got off the phone with Robert Stearns. He says, you should be my executive director for my Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, which would be the first Orthodox Jewish Center ever to dialogue with the Christian world. Meet me tonight at Ben Gurion Airport at 11.30. Okay, honey, I'll be home a little late tonight. <laughs> and I go to Rabbi Riskin and they say, listen, I am honored that you even thinking of me, but I do this from the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If I'm ever to do this, number one, I don't do this from the covenant of Noah. I think that's an insult to tell a Christian you're part of the covenant of Noah. I do this from the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's number one. Number two, your own rabbi is perceived to forbid such a relationship. I don't know how you deal with that. Three, you are an international figure in world jury. You have helped women's rights in Israel, actually winning in the Supreme Court against the chief rabbinate to have women represent women in the rabbinical courts. You have the largest private institution in Israel with 3,000 students from high school through military service. You founded this city of Efrat. 
you are going to take a huge PR hit by trying to change the status quo in Jewish-Christian relations. People are not gonna understand what you're trying to do. And if I was your international director of development, I would highly suggest you don't do this. And Rabbi Riskin's answer to me was, I can do what's popular with people or I can do what's popular with God. And I, And usually if you, you know, always if you're with God, you're okay. I said, Rabbi, if you're willing to risk this, I wanna be part of history. And five years ago, we opened the center, and now, it's five years later, over 20,000 Christians have come to us to do the teachings that you've experienced tonight, to actually begin a relationship. This is my 38th trip to the United States to come to places like this who are open to a relationship to say that the, we're changing the status quo from our world and educating Jews about the importance of this relationship, but also to do this with you together. All I ask of you, if this is something that's in your heart to do, again, there's our stages that a person has in their Israel journey that this is kind of scary the relationship. It's easier to do a prayer group on Israel. It's hard to do this. If this is in your heart, then there is a center for you. There's a home for you to do this. And when you come to Israel, I already said to Pastor Mark, you have a home in Israel. And I look forward to hosting you and everyone here one time in Israel. This should be your home as well. What better way to do that in a fraught where we both believe ultimate redemption comes from? Imagine Jews and Christians finally having that conversation, finally working together for the betterment of humanity. God bless and thank you. Did you enjoy that? How would you like to have him here sometime on a Shabbat the next time he's around? That would be great. If We'd love to have you sometime. Just so you know, he has flyers on one of these tables back here where Nancy's pointing. Where's Nancy? There's Nancy. Okay, right as you go back, make sure you pick up one of his flyers that talk about his ministry. I'm hoping for those of you that are going with me on the tour that he's going to be able to come and visit with us or we'll be able to go there depending on the time. Uh, but I think this was just a wonderful time that we could uh, have together and uh, uh, be praying for Rabbi Riskin. You know, be praying for David Nekrupman. We want to keep him in our prayers because this is what El Shaddai is all about as well, isn't it? Building bridges, not burning bridges. Uh, having, you know, understanding, cooperating one with another. We serve the same God. Uh, let's close with prayer. <clears throat> Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for your Torah that you have given so graciously to us. We ask that you truly would give us uh, circumcised ears, that we could hear what you're saying and circumcise our hearts that would be received on good ground. Father, that we would truly be doers of your word and not hearers only. We thank you so much for the, the love that was shown. And uh, Father, we just love your people. And we pray right now, Father, for a, a Jewish land, for the Jewish people, Father, that uh, they could uh, call upon you freely. And we just thank you so much. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.us. Be blessed and shalom.